Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the program. I'm Tamur Shamil. Pakistan has been facing internal and external challenges. Uh, talking about uh, internal challenges, security and economics has been a challenge for Pakistan. In the last 16 years or so, since Pakistan has been fighting war on terror, uh, security has been uh, a primary issue. And Pakistan has been fighting most notorious terrorist organizations uh, in the region. Also, the terrorist uh, attacks in Pakistan had an impact on Pakistan's economy. Pakistan lost billions of dollars to its economy. We lost innocent people. And many industries that were at one time flourishing in Pakistan had to move out, out of Pakistan. And that was primarily because of uh, the security situation. Security and economy are certainly interlinked and both are very important. But now, since Pakistan is working on uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, a mega economic activity that is going to be a game changer in the region, uh, Pakistan is now addressing both the issues of economy and of security. How would Pakistan address these two issues? And what are the strategies made by the policy makers for security and economy? We are going to discuss this with our guest today. Our first guest is uh, Mr. Vakar Ahmed. He is uh, Deputy Executive Director of Sustainable Development Policy Institute, Islamabad. Welcome to the program, Mr. Vakar. Our second guest is Mr. Dr. Uh, Khurram Iqbal. He is a defense analyst and a professor at National Defense University, Islamabad. Welcome to the program, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Khurram. Vakar, starting with the security situation and economy, certainly they are both uh, interlinked. Um, terrorism and uh, uh, this whole extremism issue had an impact on Pakistan's economy. Uh, after the war on terror, when it started in 2001, uh, it adversely uh, affected Pakistan's economy. From that time till now, and recently in the last three, four years, how do you see Pakistan's economy uh, related to uh, security and all that? Yes, I think this is a very important point which you have made. And according to government's own conservative estimates, uh, it has uh, costed us uh, somewhere around $120 billion, uh, which is direct and indirect cost of terrorism, which this country has been facing. Uh, and of course, uh, Unfortunately, the problems, of course, kept on increasing during the past decade. Uh, and at one point, uh, you, you had to sort of draw the line and put in place a strategy uh, to sort of deal with all of these issues in a very comprehensive manner. Thankfully, that was also a time uh, when uh, our all-weather friend, China, of course, came into picture. Uh, in the form of, of course, uh, not just CPEC, but also wider China-Pakistan cooperation as well. And I think perceptions about Pakistan uh, started changing uh, from 2013 and 14. Pakistan also started making a lot of concerted efforts to have comprehensive all-out action against all forms of extremism or, or terrorism, if I can call them. And, uh, and, and I think uh, while Pakistan is doing this, it's not that things aren't happening. It's just that there is greater confidence in the local as well as the foreign business community, people who may like to engage with Pakistan's economy, that uh, Pakistan at least has the strategic direction right. And you can see that in number terms now. Uh, it is not just Chinese investment which has increased in the past quarter. It's also non-China investment, non-China FDI, which has increased. The past two months have also seen Pakistan's exports numbers increase as well. And there is investment coming, coming in export-oriented industries. This is good news because in the next phase of CPEC, Pakistan will be focusing on the special economic zones uh, which the country will be moving towards. And these SEZs would be in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, Balochistan, areas where, where, where uh, economic activity and livelihoods really needs to be uh, invigorated. Uh, Dr. Khurram, talking about these economic zones, certainly Pakistan has a plan and both countries, Pakistan and China, would be working on this mega economic activity. Uh, the zones, as Dr. Khur, uh, Dr. Bakar mentioned, would be in KPK, Balochistan, Punjab as well. Uh, KPK and Balochistan have been disturbed areas, and these areas were worst hit by uh, terrorism. Uh, what have we done to secure these areas? Because if we want to bring, let's say, prosperity, we have to bring it at the grassroots level. People all over Pakistan, across the board, they have to see the development or the prosperity that we are you know, uh, dreaming about. Uh, what have we done about these areas to secure these areas? Tamur, I consider China-Pakistan Economic Corridor as a strategic response to violent extremism. 
Violent extremism uh, has uh, found ground in KPK and Balochistan because poverty was rampant, because those two provinces suffered from severe and serious infrastructural developmental issues. That's why violent ideologies found a lot of appeal among the people of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan province. As China-Pakistan economic corridor continues to unfold in those areas, you would see that it would have a direct impact on reducing violent extremism. A uh, number of research have been done and it's been uh, noted that violent extremism is often very high in the areas where there is uh, rampant poverty. Uh, with the inception of these special economic zones, new uh, opportunities, new avenues for the employment are uh, emerging for the natives of those two provinces. And if we talk specifically about Balochistan, this is not for the first time that Balochistan uh, witnessed an insurrection. It's been there for decades. This is perhaps the fourth insurrection in the province. And one of the main cause of insurrections and repeated insurgencies has been the underdevelopment of Balochistan. Baloch people, they have some genuine and valid grievances with regards to the role of uh, the center, which uh, intentionally or unintentionally failed to develop Balochistan. So CPAC will come as a developmental response to uh, insurgency and insurrection. It will provide a developmental narrative to, to, to the narrative being uh, advocated by the insurgents and terrorists in the both provinces. So I'm quite optimist. So what, what, when we talk about economy and security, Dr. Vakar, uh, what do you think is the most important thing Securing an area first or bringing in st uh, stability first over there, uh, giving people the opportunity for, let's say, more jobs, more uh, business over there. How do you see yes. the economy and, and security question? No, that, 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 that's right. And I, I, I fully agree with Dr. Khuram, you know. Stability uh, in terms of uh, peace, of course, will remain a prerequisite. Uh, there's no question about it because if even if a local investor has to go there, mm -hmm. do some feasibility analysis to put up a business over there, they would require some sort of security of their assets, profits, and lives mm -hmm. of their workers, of course. Uh, uh, sustaining that security in the longer term, of course, is also a challenge. And then in the second phase, ensuring rule of law over there. Mm -hmm. Contract enforcement is, of course, something that we need to uh, work on. Uh, if I can just submit here that the broader direction of the state is correct. So in its, in its own narrative, the state and all organs of state have actually reinforced now uh, that, yes, uh, on Balochistan, on KPK, even on other areas where you have localized conflict, uh, there will be work on mitigating the sources, the origins of, of, of these conflict. Right. I think this is what Chinese also want to see, you know. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, while the broader direction is correct, it is also important to take our private sector on board. Ultimately, I think what Dr. Khurram is also saying, if you have to create jobs over there, there's a limit to how much jobs public sector can create. Right. It has to be the private, private sector, sector that will right. create. So within Balochistan, you now see pockets where, for example, there is a revival of business. You see that in Las Bela, for example. Las Bela has a very vibrant chamber of commerce, uh, one of the best you would see in the country, by the way. Uh, you see economic activity go growing in Gawadar. You have already seen inflow of a lot of foreigners coming into Koita now. So there are pockets of success within uh, Balochistan, and as time passes, we hope that uh, there will be diffusion of this successful experience in other parts of Balochistan. So talking about development and, and security, uh, Dr. Khurram, uh, certainly security also varies from place to place, uh, and we need to have area-wise strategy for, for every, every area, for every place, for instance. Uh, uh, Balochistan has its own dynamics, security dynamics and economic dynamics, as Dr. Bukhar was saying. Uh, so word KPK. Uh, what are uh, the strategies made by, let's say, our government or the provincial governments in terms of security for these areas? Because Balochistan's security uh, dynamics are different and so is KPK's. How do you see this? In terms of security, the state has uh, certainly made some uh, significant gains. Uh, according to Global Terrorism Database report of 2017, the overall number of terrorist incidents have reduced to uh, uh, by 12%, which is a significant decline during the last few years. And 
KPK has witnessed the highest, uh, the, the most significant decline in numbers of terrorist incidents. But unfortunately, in case of Balochistan, there is recently there is an increase in the incidents of violent extremism. What I'm seeing now is that China-Pakistan economic corridor could have ideally transformed the terrorist landscape by providing a developmental narrative. But the response from our neighboring country has basically complicated the entire threat landscape here. Mm -hmm. If India was receptive to China-Pakistan economic corridor, it could have further augmented the fruits and rewards of CPAC for the entire region. But since India is very negative about Belt and Road Initiative in general, and CPAC in particular, it has further complicated the threat landscape here. So what has happened in case of terrorism? Uh, terrorism, until recently, remained an ideologically driven phenomena in which poverty, relative deprivation played a role. But now, what we are seeing now, uh, uh, thanks to the Indian response, terrorism has become a proxyism now. Now, terrorist groups, which were uh, in the past driven by ideological motives, now they are driven by their uh, foreign agendas. And in case of Balochistan, that's quite visible. Now, all the insurgent groups, they have been uh, dismantled from Balochistan. They have been forced to relocate to Afghanistan. And from there, they continue to operate under the patronage of Indian intelligence agencies. So. I would say that if we have to go decisive against terrorism in Balochistan province, we have to cut the insurgents' external support uh, network and in which our diplomats and our media will have to play a very active role. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we fail to cut that external support network of the insurgents, CPAC may face a lot of challenges in terms of security. This is a very important point, Dr. Vakar, that uh Economy is obviously uh, uh, connected with foreign policy as well and also with the uh, external security. While we talk about having better economy, uh, industries thriving in different areas, uh, what is happening in Afghanistan also matters a lot. If we, let's say, are planning to have a route to Central Asia, we have to pass through Afghanistan and Afghanistan needs to be uh, peaceful. Uh, proxy wars going on in Afghanistan, Jamaatul Hara, TTP, backed by uh, uh, RAW, we, 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 Pakistani officials on record saying that they are backed by raw. Uh, foreign policy and economy, how do you see these two things and what can Pakistan do to improve, let's say, its relations or let's say ask Afghanistan to take action against those terrorists so that we can have a better economy in the region? I think Pakistan has been lately very serious about improving ties with all neighbors, you know. And that remains a cornerstone, a, p a key pillar of our foreign policy. Uh, it, you, you have recently see, seen in case of Afghanistan and Iran, our army chief himself visited the leadership in both countries. Our civilian leadership has also visited their counterparts in both countries. Uh, in case of Afghanistan, the message was uh, absolutely on the lines which you have said that Afghanistan needs to f first sort of do some homework on their own home ground so that it can help uh, the overall Afghan reconciliation process. Uh, the quadrilateral process of dialogue, uh, which, which is there in place, of course, Pakistan backs it, that should be sort of put in place. Uh, on Iran, again, we have proposed that Iran should become part of the overall CPEC initiative. We have offered them the benefits of, of CPEC once uh, it is in full flow. Uh, Iran has themselves offered that Pakistan should be made part of the Chabahar tri trilateral uh, mm -hmm. agreement, you know, which, which Iran has offered. So these are good things. On India, again, Pakistan has communicated that we are most willing to host uh, the SAC heads of state uh, meeting, which was postponed last year. And that is only possible if, of course, India is willing to come. And we have uh, approached them at two separate forums that, that, that I, I at least have knowledge of. And this has been formally communicated. Uh, we are very serious in restoring the SAC process. We believe that healthy relationship with South Asia, not just in terms of trade and investment cooperation, but of course, security cooperation is also essential. You have recently seen that uh, both counterparts at an environmental or DR, a disaster uh, risk reduction level, had to pick up the phones in Islamabad and Delhi when the smog had engulfed both countries. So there are issues, there will remain issues on which you will certainly need to talk. Uh, now, 
In case of China, you know, the cooperation is now being expanded many folds, where China is now promoting Pakistan's position in CARIC, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program. And under the QTT agreement, China is sort of not uh, the, the, the wait and see game whether Afghanistan will allow mm -hmm. Pakistan to go up to Tajikistan or not, we have sort of bypassed that and China is now ready to operationalize QTTA so that Pakistan can access the Central Asian markets through China now. So these are important foreign policy developments and would be essential for economic uh, future of Pakistan. E economy, uh, Asia has, has a dream and that is of rising Asia. And all the countries in Asia obviously would be working in the next decade or so on improving their economies. China is spearheading this whole uh, this idea of improving uh, economy, but security would also be a threat and a challenge in the future, Dr. Khurram, as we have been discussing earlier. Daesh, the new phenomenon, 16 years on, there are more terrorist organizations in Afghanistan because this is, this is an issue. Uh, U.S. came in Afghanistan to fight the Taliban, but after that, we have TTP over there, we have Jamaatul Ahra, Daesh, and many more uh, other terrorist organizations. Pakistan is trying to improve its economy, but these terrorists who have the safe heavens in Afghanistan are targeting innocent people in Pakistan. They have been trying to uh, uh, make things difficult for the foreign investors as well. What can we do, the regional countries and Pakistan, to bring up this issue that terrorism needs to be eliminated, not just from, we have been doing enough in Pakistan, but from Afghanistan? There are a number of steps that we can consider at the operational and strategic level. At operational level, of course, you have to go decisive against terrorists, and this is what Pakistan has done uh, during the last uh, uh, one decade or so. A series of military operations, very successful, Operation Radul Fasad being the most recent one. Fatah was once infested with uh, terrorist organizations. Now they have been forced to relocate to Afghanistan. Uh, this is, of course, an operational response to terrorism. In terms of strategy, uh, we have to give a developmental response. That's where CPAC is there. And if it becomes fully functional, that will certainly provide an avenue for cooperation for a number of states there. At uh, strategic level, I would say uh, that uh, the membership of uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a very important milestone in terms of, 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 of our strategic response to violent extremism. Shanghai Cooperation Organization is fundamentally a security organization that was created to fight against non-traditional threats. Mm -hmm. And then economy uh, became one part of that. Since Pakistan and India became part of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, the researchers and scholars are a little optimist that membership of such organization may provide both countries a platform where they can sit together, where they can discuss issues uh, which are not negotiable uh, on, on the table of SARC. Uh, SARC was a genuinely a good idea, but that was hijacked. Uh, because of the India-Pakistan rivalry. But if you look at the dynamics of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I don't think that in presence of uh, big wigs like Russia and China, Pakistan and India, uh, they, they would have to sit together. And that would uh, basically pave the way for a regional response to counterterrorism. There are more Terrorism now is a transnational phenomenon. You cannot fight terrorism without involving the regional players. You hit terrorism in Pakistan, they will move to Afghanistan. If Afghans are not on board, they would reorganize and they would hit back. So what we need is we and need this a is regional... directly affecting Afghanistan and Afghanistan this economy. Is, this is certainly affecting Afghanistan. This is what China and Russia, Pakistan think. That's why Shanghai Cooperation Organization is very instrumental in terms of providing a regional response to to terrorism. Their uh, their mechanism for counterterrorism, uh, which is called RATS, that is one of the most I would say um, effective instrument at the regional level. So if Pakistan <coughs> and India have become the part of SC. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that they that would encourage both countries to go for a regional response to violent extremism. Dr. Vika, uh, different analysts and experts are of the view that uh, economic model in the in the region is changing. Earlier, economy was directly related to a linked with with war, and war was going on in, in Afghanistan for the last I would say 30 years now. But now there's this new paradigm, and that is development. You can't make money out of war. The, the era is uh, over. Now we have to work on development. 
because you can't uh, keep on fighting war in Afghanistan, keep on building more, let's say, terrorist organizations or uh, warlords, but now that you have to bring those warlords and perhaps those people to the table where they can see that development is the new model, is the new paradigm. Let's everybody develop, develop better economic systems and work on development. So do you think that these are two, let's say, paradigms, two models that are coming up? Yes, no, certainly I think there's a growing realization uh, that uh, with peace, of course, you can have more sustained economies, more strengthened economies, more inclusive economies, you know. And I think with the rise of new regional powers like China, Turkey, of course, in the region, um, it is, of course, uh, important to say that mm. they have their own interests in keeping the region connected. Uh, Turkey, you have seen, has, has taken sort of an implicit relationship, uh, implicit position in sort of reinvigorating ECO, Economic Cooperation Organization, mm. you know. And they are really pumping in a lot of money into this body. They have recently had ECO Bank coming up, uh, of which Pakistan has taken the leadership, of course. Uh, so so the, the, the rise of new economies also tells you how important connection activity is in the region. Now, going forward, the, the key economic model which these countries are proposing is the, the, the regional value chain development. So you may be producing some sort of parts and components which would be exported to China. China may be processing them and then exporting it to some other uh, country. So an entire spaghetti bowl, of course, is, is, is involved and in the end a final product is produced. Now this is, this is the business model that has come up, you know. Uh, it's not that any country would in the end be producing a whole single commodity. Countries would specialize in components, you know. So even in case of Pakistan's special economic zones which are being planned, uh, the Chinese have been telling us that you have to take care of your interest at what can you produce on a comparative advantage and supply to us so that it can become part of our value chain, you know. Chinese are willing to buy our products, you know, but we, we need to provide them some certainty mm -hmm. that yes, after the CPEC early harvest projects, our energy supplies or certainty of other inputs will ensure certainty of outputs, logistics, of course, and there will be in-time delivery of the consignments. Now, we'll continue our discussion on Pakistan's economy and security. These two uh, are the challenges, I would say, these two are the goals uh, to improve economy and also to make sure that people in Pakistan are secure. We'll continue our discussion on this point after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Economy and security are uh, interconnected, are also interrelated. Uh, both have impact on each other. Pakistan has been fighting war on terror. Pakistan has been fighting terrorist organizations. And also we have seen in the last five, six years, Pakistan has uh, improved its economy. And we have also seen an excellent improvement in the security sphere as well. Dr. Khurram, talking about development and security, and we were discussing about uh, uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, there will be challenges. We have goals, we have set our goals, and that is that Pakistan is going to prosper, Pakistan is going to go for development, but the challenges are also there. Challenges would be more in the security sphere, <coughs> and that would have an impact on the economy. Hybrid warfare is another concept, and we might be expecting that kind of uh, challenges as well. Uh, how do you see uh, challenges in the future for Pakistan and for CPEC and how Pakistan is going to address them. Indian strategic community thinks that CPEC will bring unprecedented opportunities and wealth to Pakistan. They are concerned that Pakistan may convert this wealth to increase its military muscle. And they are afraid and uh, for 
uh, wrong reasons that Pakistan may transform that military muscle to hinder India's regional and global ambitions. Yes. Why is that so? Uh, they are the prisoners of history. Indian strategic thinkers consider Pakistan as a residue of those Central Asian invaders who have been invading India across from Khyber and going on to the Red Fort. So they still think that Pakistan is the residue of those invaders and if Pakistan becomes economically stable, it may pose a security challenge to India. Based on this reason, India has dedicated millions of dollars to create specialized desks within the research and analysis wing, RAW, uh, the, intel the premier intelligence agency of India, to sabotage China-Pakistan economic dollar corridor. Dollar 500 million. <clears throat> Yep. Uh, as it was said by General Zubair, Chairman Joint Chief of Staff Committee. Yeah, so exactly. It's 500, it's 500, million, 500 million dollars. So they wish to dedicate these resources to sabotage uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor. But is this going to be productive? Is this mm -hmm. going to contribute to regional peace and connectivity? I don't think it would have. Uh, it would contribute something positively. As far as Pakistan is concerned, as far as China is concerned, both the countries have officially invited India to become a part of China-Pakistan economic corridor. Lieutenant General Amir Riaz, when he was the commander of Southern Corps, he is on record inviting India to come and join the power of CPAC, share the dividends with India, but Indian response was not encouraging to say the but least. But why this duplicity that India is, is, is a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organizations, but India criticizes China-Pakistan economic corridor, India doesn't want to become part of OBOR. They have their uh, issues uh, on the borders with, with China, with Pakistan, with Sri Lanka, with Nepal. This duplicity from the Indian side, how do you see this? I think Indian strategic community is <coughs> very confused at the moment with regards to the new development. their dealings mm. with China, with regards to their dealings with the Belt and Road Initiative. Take, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative Forum, which was uh, organized in Beijing a few months ago. Uh, even Japan sent its delegation to the forum. America sent a high power delegation to its forum. It was only India which was not present in that mega uh, forum that was intended to bring prosperity and connectivity to the world. So India is standing on the, on the wrong side of the history. Uh, for how long they would continue with that, that remains to be seen. But if India continues with this behavior, that may create a lot of hindrances in the rise of Asia. The rise of Asia is attached to Belt and Road Initiative. If you remember, historically, Silk Routes have played a very important role in, in, the, in, the, in the glory of Asia. Asia was glorified, Asia was vibrant, Asia was economically prosperous because of the ancient Silk Routes. So the idea behind Belt and Road Initiative is to revive, to revive those Silk Routes. Right. And if Silk Routes are revived, it's a win-win for the entire Asian continent. But at the moment, Indian response is hindering that dream. And I think the implementation of Belt and Road Initiative um, may be a little bit of disturbed because of the Indian response. Pakistan's security and economy both are also directly connected with what is happening in Afghanistan. And this is what we were, we were discussing before the break. Uh, Pakistan's relations with the US, Afghan war, uh, US President Trump's uh, new strategy for Afghanistan and South Asia. How do you see the strategy, increasing troops in Afghanistan, and perhaps the war might also continue? And if the war continues in Afghanistan, things would not be that pleasant for Pakistan, for China, perhaps other countries which are looking for development in the region. So U.S. strategy for, for Afghanistan and South Asia and development, how do you see this? We can link this question to Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, some Chinese scholars and high officials are of the view that uh, there are intentional efforts by the countries in the other bloc to jeopardize Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they believe that there are two important nodes of Belt and Road Initiative. One is the Middle East, second is the Central Asia, yeah. Afghanistan. They believe that Middle East, there was an effort by the Western powers to destabilize the entire Middle East and that was intended to sabotage the Belt and Road Initiative, but the West failed in the Middle East. They 
look at the situation with the same lens, they think that if Daesh is making inroads in Afghanistan, it is happening with the patronage of some state actors. And those state actors are trying to cultivate Daesh to basically disturb this second important nod of Belt and Road Initiative. That's why countering Daesh is on the top of the Chinese agenda. That is why countering Daesh is one of the top priority of, of, of Russia, Turkey, Pakistan, and other regional stakeholders because these countries believe that if Daesh is allowed to establish its presence, it will certainly disturb the broad spectrum of Belt and Road initiative. What is the nature of Daesh? Because when we talk about Daesh, these are perhaps a handful of people present in Afghanistan. This is not, perhaps, according to some people, that this is not as big a threat as uh, Al-Qaeda was at one point. And ideologically, they were operating in many parts of the world. Perhaps, uh, by the way, so is Daesh. But how do you see the threat of Daesh? How serious is the threat for Russia, China, Pakistan, and other countries? Daesh is certainly on the run. In Middle East, they have lost territory. They have lost resources. And in their defeat in the Middle East, it was basically Russia which played a very decisive role against Daesh. Americans did try to counter Daesh by supporting <coughs> groups like Al Nusra Front, but that strategy failed. That strategy proved counterproductive because you cannot pitch one terrorist against an other. Yeah. So at the end, what proved decisive was, was the Russian defense and the Russian aggression, the Russian air attacks against Daesh, which, which basically pushed Daesh out of their strongholds in the Middle East. Yeah. So now once they have lost Middle East, Daesh is on the run. Daesh is not centralized. But a decentralized terrorist organization is more dangerous than a centralized uh, terrorist so organization. They have different franchises now. They have different franchises. They have different sleeper cells in different parts of Europe. So those sleeper cells can be very and uh, in deadly. Afghanistan. And we have seen in case of Europe. In case of Afghanistan, Daesh has tried to establish footholds. Mm. Uh, there were some reports that when Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was under tremendous pressure in Middle East, he may have tried to escape to this region because he knows that Afghanistan is chaotic. There is no rate of the state in Afghanistan in more than 40 to 50 percent of Afghanistan. So he tried to manipulate this disadvantage into his favor, whether he was able to make uh, his way to Afghanistan but uh, there are reports that some senior members of Daesh Central have certainly moved to Afghanistan. If they are there, they would certainly try to reorganize themselves. And if they are allowed to reorganize in Afghanistan, that will be, uh, I would say, very uh, dangerous for the regional uh, peace and security. Now, recently, uh, Chief of Army Staff also <coughs> visited Iran. Uh, Pakistan's Foreign Minister, Khwaja Asif, visited China uh, also. They went together, Prime Minister Shahid Khan Abbasi, Chief of Army Staff, General Prajba, uh, DGISI, and Foreign Minister uh, went to Riyadh as well. Uh, also, Riyadh has started this coalition against terrorism. Uh, regional countries, Middle East, Saudi Arab, Pakistan's connections with Iran, and what, what is common is that all these countries, and Pakistan specifically, they are focusing on counter-terrorism. Mm -hmm. And how serious do you think are the countries in the region? Iran and other countries to put an end to terrorism? Well, uh, they are certainly very serious, but it's, it, uh, their threat perception differs, uh, not from each other, but from the Western th threat perception. From a Western perspective, Afghan Taliban pose serious threat. But from the regional threat perception, it's not Afghan Taliban, it's Daesh which poses a serious threat. Mm -hmm. I would not expand the scope of this, this discussion to the Middle East because the threat landscape of Middle East is much more complex. So if we just look at it in the context of Afghanistan, Daesh is the threat number one for regional peace and uh, the regional countries, they understand that. That is why they are improvising their counterterrorism strategies with a focus on eliminating Daesh. For example, Iran. Uh, historically, the relations between Afghan Taliban and Iran have not been very um, healthy, to say the least. Um, uh, they were actually ideological rivals. But since Daesh came to Afghanistan, Iran has made conscious efforts to co-opt Afghan Taliban because they think that Afghan Taliban can effectively fight against Daesh. And we can, by the way, also see the fight going on between Daesh and Taliban in Nangarhar. 
at the moment, last three, four, five days, these two uh, uh, terrorist organizations, uh, Taliban and, and Daesh, they have been fighting in Nangarhar for, for greater control of the region. Uh, it's and been this... going on for more than 10 months now. Mm -hmm. Afghan mm -hmm. Taliban, they formed an elite squad to fight Daesh because it is their turf, it's their territory, and they believe if Daesh is allowed to uh, create footholds here, uh, their survival will be at stake. So that's where uh, the interests converge between Afghan Taliban, Iran, China, and Russia. Even from a Russian perspective, Daesh poses a bigger threat because Daesh thinks that it was Russians who defeated them in the Middle East. Right. So Daesh is bent upon avenging their defeat against Russia, and they might do so from Afghanistan. And to, to give a decisive fight against Daesh in Afghanistan, Russians may be banking upon Afghan Taliban. Right. My last question, and that is that uh, Pakistan has launched successful military operations against the terrorist organizations, uh, TTP, Jamaatul Ahrar, Al Qaeda, and many other ETIM for that matter. Uh, we have secured our areas from Swat, South Waziristan, Karachi for that matter, uh, North Waziristan, and, and Rajgal Valley. Uh, this is what the military operations can do. We can eliminate their hideouts. We can we can uh, eliminate the terrorists. But on the governance side, where we need to make a policy for the people to improve economy and secure them, and also get rid of extremism for that matter. Because in Pakistan's case, extremism has also given, encouraged terrorism at times. Sectarianism has also encouraged terrorism. How would we, on the governance side, address this issue? And how important is Governance is intrinsically linked to counterterrorism policies. Military operations, it's a very operational response to terrorism. Yeah. They are certainly effective and useful to dismantle the physical infrastructure of terrorists. But to challenge the ideological infrastructure of terrorism, it's very important to focus on governance and development. And that's where China-Pakistan Economic Corridor comes into, uh, into action. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, it is, if it becomes effective on the pace that we are desiring, it would give a developmental response to mm -hmm. terrorism. It may uh, have uh, significant implications on improving the governance structures right. in the conflict-hit regions of Pakistan that would ultimately lead towards a decisive battle against violent extremism. Dr. Khurram, pleasure having you on the program. Thank you Thank for you. your time. That's all from today's program. Uh, terrorism and el eliminating terrorism is the most important thing. Uh, uh, security and economy are uh, interlinked. Pakistan has to work on both eliminating the terrorists and also giving people enough opportunity where they can find more job opportunities and better uh, financial security. Thank you for watching today's program. See you next time. Khuda.